Good afternoon. Yes, we are starting one minute early. Um, our speaker has a bus to catch, so I told him we'd, we would keep him on time today. So, Welcome, <laughs> Welcome to the Rotary Club of Madison. Uh, my name is Charles McClymonds, and I'm honored to serve as your club president this year. I open today's meeting with the sad news of the death of longtime member Nelson Cummings. Passed away on October 15th at the age of 89. In 1969, Nelson was the first African American to join our Rotary Club. He maintained 100% attendance starting in 1973 until the pandemic. Nelson received our club's most prestigious award, the Joseph G. Werner Meritorious Service Award in 2021. He served on our club board of directors, was a longtime volunteer for our annual ethics symposium, and was a member of our club's bowling team for 40 years. Our club has made a $100 gift in his name to our Madison Rotary Foundation to establish a Nelson Cummings Memorial Fund. And anyone wishing to make a gift to this fund uh, can send it into the Rotary office or do it online. So let's please pause for a moment uh, remembering our friend and member Nelson. Thank you. Today's meeting is sponsored by Regina Milner and Jim Rooley. Regina Milner joined our club in 1994 and served as our club president in 2006-07. She is sponsoring today's meeting in honor of the Chazen Museum of Art. You'll find some materials on the table. And the Chazen's expansive two-building site holds the second largest collection of art in Wisconsin and is the largest collecting museum in the Big Ten. And Jim Rooley our club in 19, joined our club in 1973 and served as club president in 1999-2000. He's sponsoring the meeting in honor of Big Brothers, Big Sisters of Dane County, noting his gratitude and admiration for the service they provide in creating positive and often lifelong relationships with local youth in need of such experiences. Our thanks to Regina and Jim for sponsoring today's meeting. Please remain standing for our opening music, and Robert Reed will lead us in the national anthem with Jeff Bartell at the keyboard. Then Robert will lead us in singing, singing the Adams Family theme song. <laughs> oh, say can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hail? At the twilight's last gleaming, whose rough stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight, oh, the ramparts we wash were so gallantly streaming, and the rocket's red glare, the bombs bursting in air. A seat and but and enjoy the Addis family. The creepy and the kooky, mysterious and spooky, they're all together, ooky, the Addis family.
The house is a museum where people come to see them. They're really a scream. The Adder family. So get a witch's straw on, a broomstick you can crawl on. We're going to make a call on the Adams family. Thank you all and happy Halloween. Oh. Got some werewolves. I saw a witch in the audience, too, so. Thank you. Um, Susie Drazen will introduce today's guest. Susie? Good afternoon. And as I call your name, our dear guest, if you could please rise at your place and remain standing. Our guest today, Catherine Alcaucus, guest of Regina Milner. Wally Arts, guest of Marina, Maria Heidi. Todd Bry, guest of Bill Zineman. Mary Batari, guest of the program committee. Tom Bush, guest of Valerie Rank. Chris Campbell, guest of Susan Schmitz. Siavata Adari, guest of Joyce Bromley. Paul Gessner, guest of Neil Fauerbach. And Tom, Sam Munger, guest of Joel Riblin. Thank you so much for joining us today. Welcome to our guest. Um, I'm going to provide today's moment of gratitude. Um, I was supposed to have two guests here today as well, uh, my friends uh, Bill and Karen Garlow. And uh, Jane, maybe you could put up the, um, the photo if you have it. Yeah. That's a picture of, uh, of me and Bill. Uh, Bill visited our club uh, last June, uh, in, uh, and we were here. Um, I don't think I'm wearing the same outfit, but it's similar. Um, I do have other outfits, so, um, but um, Bill, Bill, is my, Bill is my Rotary sponsor and is uh, largely responsible for getting me into Rotary uh, 15 years ago now back in Naperville, Illinois, and Bill was preparing for his uh, presidential year. Uh, he served as uh, the past president of the Rotary Club of Naperville, and I was uh, freshly uh, a new executive director at Loaves and Fishes Community Services in Naperville. And uh, Bill and a couple of other Rotarians came to me and they said, hey, we want to do uh, a new fundraiser. It's a new concept for our club uh, and called Soups On. And we would like your organization uh, to be one of the beneficiaries. Would you like to work with us and would that be okay? And I said, absolutely. And uh, so I worked alongside uh, Rotarians for the, in planning the first Soups On. It ran for, uh, for eight years and raised uh, about a million dollars for, uh, for three uh, charities to combat hunger and homelessness in DuPage County, Illinois. And so after, uh, after the first uh, soups on, um, you know, I said, how could I not join this group of Rotarians that are doing so much good in the community and providing service above self? And so it was really my introduction uh, to Rotary was through service. Uh, but my moment of gratitude today, well, I'm very grateful for having been a part of that. But it really is about the friendships that are created through Rotary. And um, I said, uh, you know, uh, when I started that Bill and Karen were supposed to be joining me here today. Uh, they've been staying with us for the past two days. And unfortunately, they both have been dealing with some very significant health issues. Bill had a heart transplant in the middle of the pandemic in August of 2020 at Duke University Medical Center, um, doing, doing well, uh, you know, considering uh, the, what a miracle of modern medicine to have a heart transplant. Uh, Karen has been battling her own issues and multiple surgeries and um, started having some symptoms and fighting an infection. We just took her to the UW Hospital emergency room last night about nine o'clock and they admitted her. So. Um, I'm keeping them, holding them, uh, you know, in my thoughts, but just um, think about the friendships that you have created. Those are lifetime friends, you know, um, that, that, are, that have been created through Rotary, created through service, and we have the opportunity every week to see so many friends uh, and people and uh, to really 
create meaningful and lasting relationships. And that is really how we connect, grow, and serve as Rotarians, and I'm very grateful for that. Charles Tubbs is in the house, and uh, the other Charles, uh, and he's going to kick off our, uh, our fun drive and has a message for us. I don't know if you know this, but the two Charles are twins. Yes. yes. <laughs> Names have been changed to protect the innocent. Thank you, and good afternoon, fellow Rotarians. <coughs> I have the privilege and the opportunity, and I'm very pleased to be chairing the Fun Drive Committee for Rotary Foundation this year. Thank you. I should point out, I also used to be the warrant officer for the police department. <laughs> and when people didn't, people didn't do what they were supposed to, they had to pay up. So that's a little fair warning, pay up. Jane is going to show you the four, uh, on the PowerPoint here, the four priority for giving it to our club this year. I can't really see them as well, Jane, but you can see them, I think, pretty well here. It's four ways of contributing to Rotary, which includes the fun drive, which, again, I'm chairing this year. A mailing went out on Monday. If you haven't received it yet, it should be in your mailbox today. In the envelope, you will include a summary sheet, the priorities of giving to our club, the amounts of contributions over the past year, and various funds. And, and it can be confusing, so take a few minutes to review the chart and mail it. Our goal this year is 135000 It is achievable if we all make a gift. The important thing is that you give. The size of the gift is not the focus. As we work our, our way to the end of the charitable giving year, think about our Rotary groups and the difference we make in the community. Last year, we funded over 40 local organizations, and we have transferred to a two new grants this year. Our two new grant committees are finalized in the recommendations and will be announcing their new educational uh, grants in two weeks. We have a club that truly cares and our community needs us. And it's, it's a time we need to show support to everyone. Take the platform you received in the mail today and complete it and send it back to the Brody office so you won't have to look at me every week. <laughs> that might be a pleasure. Let's give from our hearts. Let's reach back and help those who are not as fortunate as you and I. Let's do the right thing for the right reason and give successfully to the fun drive. Thank you. Thank you, Charles. Um, some of you may recall that last week, past president Paul Hoffman donated two tickets um, to, the, to the volleyball game, um, and we did win that one. Uh, but um, I would like to encourage others who have um, tickets to um, you know, the games, uh, volleyball, basketball coming up soon, um, Madison Symphony Orchestra, Wisconsin Chamber Orchestra, Overture Center, you know, any of those that you'd like to, uh, to donate, we can use those uh, to have some fun and to, um, to get some more gifts for the campaign. So think about that, um, and we'll have fun with this campaign. And you, you will continue to hear um, coming out, we will be rolling out our uh, recipients of the new Excellence in Education and Innovation Grant Awards uh, coming up, I believe, on November 8th. So, thank you. Director nominations. We started, uh, we announced the process uh, last week, and I'd like to once again uh, talk about our, uh, our candidates. Um, first of all, I'd like to introduce, again, our Board of Directors. If you're here, please stand up. Maria Alvarez-Stroud, Brian Chan, Mary Donahue, Anthony Gray, Mark Green, Scott Homerson, Paul Hoffman, Jason Ilstrup, Jason and Pat are actually at the large club conference right now, Mike McKay, Elaine Mishler, Casey Elkers, Maggie Porter Kratz, and Jen Sabino. So please thank them for their service.
you know, our club has staggered terms, so Mary, Anthony, Mark, Jason, Casey, and Jen's terms will end on June 30th. And we begin the process to elect six new directors. Uh, we talked about them uh, last week. provides for that. You do need to have, if somebody wants to do that, you need to have uh, the, the names and signatures into PAT at the office by October 25th. So thanks again to our nominees and for our board of directors. Dave Bornstein is going to come up and talk about some volunteer, a volunteer opportunity. Come on up, Dave. Thank you, President Charles. We have two volunteer opportunities coming up. Uh, the first one is on November 19th. It's at the Goodman Community Center. We're looking for volunteers to help hand out Thanksgiving baskets to cars. Uh, it should start around 11.15 that day, go for a couple hours or so. And then on December 13th at the Alliance Center, we have an event with the Empty Stocking Club. We are looking for Rotarians to volunteer as toy shoppers and help families pick out presents for their children. Um, Speaking of presents, in a couple of weeks, we'll be starting our holiday gift drive. And we are working with the Lucier Community Center, Goodman Community Center, and the Salvation Army. Please consider helping us reach our goal of providing 100 presents this year. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Great opportunities. Uh, a number of you, you probably received or saw several messages that yesterday was actually actually World Polio Day, um, celebrate, celebrated by Rotary International. Uh, it's an opportunity to highlight global efforts toward a polio-free world and honor the tireless contributions of those on the front lines in the fight to eradicate polio from every corner of the globe. Rotary's been working to eradicate polio for more than 35 years, and our goal of ridding the world of the disease is closer than ever. Today, the pandemic is, uh, the endemic is on, in only two countries, Afghanistan and Pakistan. And that said, both of these two countries and many others, particularly in Africa and Asia, are still vulnerable to outbreaks if the disease is accidentally introduced by international travelers or some other means. So uh, it's one of the great things that Rotary is known for. Um, Ed Fuda will tell you that that's how Rotary got to the, the table of the UN and to be able to have those conversations at a, a global level. The Gates Foundation came to Rotary International to work with us to eradicate polio. So keep that in mind. I know many of you give to the Rot Rotary uh, International Polio Plus Fund, and we will also continue to make uh, gifts to honor our speakers to that fund. We have uh, the Ethics Workshop uh, coming up. The Ethics Symposium Committee will be holding three separate sessions of a Rotary, R-O-T-A-R-Y, Ethical Decision-Making Workshop. If you attend, you'll learn a framework for ethical decision making you can use in your personal, professional, and community life, and you will participate in a demonstration of materials, including the ethical decision making cube for our use at the Rotary Ethics Symposium on February 9th, 2023. And as we expand the activities of the Rotary Ethics Symposium Committee, you would like, if you'd like to attend one of these three 90-minute sessions to be trained uh, in this framework. They'll be held at Bob Schumacher's office on the Capitol Square on November 2nd, 3rd, and 7th. And there will be a link in this Friday's email for you to sign up. So another one of the great things that our club does and that we, are, we can be really proud of. We have a birthday to celebrate. Uh, I think Maria Alvarez Stroud is our only birthday today, unusual. Um, and she has made a gift to our uh, community grant endowment fund. Uh, and Maria says, um, Recently, a good friend sent me this quote I want to share. It's not what you gather, 
but what you scatter that tells the kind of life you've lived. Maria adds, I think an easy way to embrace for Rotarians, but maybe a good reminder. So let's wish uh, Maria and anybody else who has a birthday a happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Rotarians. Happy birthday to you. Great. We have some members in the news. Uh, Michelle Harris was interviewed on Channel 15 about Halloween costume options available at Goodwill stores. Sabrina Madison was interviewed on PBS's Wisconsin in Black and White Report, Impacts of Housing Discrimination on Economic Opportunity. Renee Moe was quoted in an article about United Way's launch of 211. Uh, Letitia Nelson was quoted in an article titled Goodman Community Center uh, Seats New Record on First Day of Thanksgiving Basket Registration. Congratulations to Jara Rios Rodriguez, who is one of the five Madison Magazine 2023 Amy Award Entrepreneur winners. And congratulations to Lynn Sexton, who has recently been asked to join the International Women's Forum of Wisconsin. So Rotarian's doing great things in the community. Yes. And Tom, we're actually running ahead of schedule, so I'm going get to you, get you to your bus on time. So our speaker today is Tom Lynch, who has over 30 years in the transportation planning field, where his planning efforts have resulted in over half a billion dollars of infrastructure improvements in four states. For the past five years, Tom has served as the director of transportation for the city of Madison. The department includes metro transit, traffic engineering, and parking. Tom is going to speak with us about Madison's transportation history and the exciting new initiatives being implemented, including BRT, Bus Rapid Transit, Complete Green Streets, Vision Zero, and Passenger Rail Planning. Tom, we look forward to your presentation, and as I mentioned, we've made a donation to the Rotary International Polio Plus Fund to thank you for speaking with us today. We will also have question and answer after the, uh, the speaker, time permitting. So let's welcome Tom to the podium. get my timer out because <clears throat> I, I have 80 slides and I, we'll see how this goes right <clears throat> hang on uh, let's start with just a thank you to some of my sources I will <clears throat> okay I'm uh, going to start with a thank you uh, to a lot of my sources that includes the Wisconsin Historic Society uh, David Molinoff and his uh, classic book um, Sue Levitin two books uh, uh, and then Johnson. Uh, also, a special thank you to the Strand Associates. Some of the photos that I'm showing were from their archives. I have uh, 80 slides, so I am just going to be touching on some of the key parts of our transportation history. Um, early indigenous paths. Um, let's just stop right there and just think, you know, there were people here before Madison was settled, right? And this is an illustration of where some of the uh, indigenous settlements were from the UW Cartography Office, um, and it also shows their trails. It's interesting if you superimpose our street network on it, it you can kind of see East Washington, Fishhead Street, Park Street, isn't it? You know, perhaps those streets might have started as, uh, as trails. If we go to our more modern history, <clears throat> this is Madison's first plat map of 1836. This plat That's 170 people, okay? That's 170 people. And this was instrumental in uh, convincing uh, delegates to nominate Madison or assign Madison as the state capital. Uh, you really aren't a town unless you have a railroad, right? And you really needed a railroad back in, in those days. We got our first railroad in 1854. It was called the Milwaukee Road, okay? <clears throat> and it, it helped us. Back then, in 1854, there was a dream that there would be nine railroads uh, coming to Madison. Uh, however, if you notice, a second railroad there at, at Sun Prairie stopped. Uh, that was the Watertown Railroad that was supposed to come in. Madison had donated $10,000 to get it here, but a de depression stopped it there. Uh, that ended up being very poor for Madison because um, 
the Watertown Railroad had much cheaper prices. So people were using the Sun Prairie to ship their goods instead of Madison. And the Sun Prairie was actually outperforming Madison during those years. It was so desperate to get a railroad that um, you know, some city leaders were trying other avenues. One was the Illinois Beloit. And so Simeon uh, Mills said, we need another road from the, from the south. And he proposed putting the railroad right on Johnson Street. However, um, a former mayor, you know, uh, Levi Vilas, lived on Johnson Street. And he says, that's a bad place for a railroad. <laughs> and um, so it was uh, referred to a committee. And actually, within about three months, that committee came up with the north side of Lake Monona. And so here you can see the uh, north, the tracks that were laid there that are kind of the foundation for the, um, that transportation system and John Nolan Drive. Um, so the water town to Sun Prairie was in 1869. Barrow Blue Line uh, occurred in um, 1871. Um, by 1887, the, Madison did get nine lines. Um, it was 30 years later from when the plan was originated. By 1899, there was 148 trains per day going through the city. Okay, it was uh, so bad that the city council passed an ordinance saying that a train couldn't block an intersection for more than five minutes. Um, they didn't have that jurisdiction, but then they convinced the state legislature to pass that ordinance. Here's an example of the Chicago Northwestern Railroad Station um, open at Blair and uh, Wilson in 1871. Okay. So this was replaced in 1910 by the building that you see there now. That's the MG&E building. Um, for local travel, well, you know, that was inner city travel. Local travel was mostly uh, continued by horse. Uh, this is a market, um, 1910 um, at Blount Street. Uh, this is a picture of East Washington Avenue in 1914. Yeah, kind of amazing, isn't it? <clears throat> I'm going to take a little diversion. Uh, into Madison Parks and Pleasure Drive. Uh, Marks, uh, Madison's Parks and Pleasure Drive Association was really quite formative in our city and the things that we love about our city. Um, they started with Lake Mendota Drive, uh, did Sherman Avenue, uh, Monona Drive. Uh, but a lot of our parks really result from the efforts of this organization. However, I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that while it was very important in our formation, it wasn't as important for transportation. You know, these were roads that you went on on the weekend to get away from the city. <laughs> um, <clears throat> similar for, uh, for Madison cycling, in 1980s or, or so, there was a Madison bicycle club that fell off because it was the big wheels and that, those were hard to ride. But the, the new modern bicycle uh, prompted the start of the Madison cycling club. It became quite a thing. In fact, Madison hosted several bicycle manufacturing facilities. Um, but again, this, uh, from what I can tell, was largely recreational and didn't play a huge transportation role. Um, what did play a huge transportation role was streetcars. Our first streetcar <coughs> um, uh, went into action in 1884 on November 16th. It was the mule cart. There was uh, 50 mules housed off of Williamson Street. And they, uh, they did passengers. I think they charged five cents um, a ride. Unfortunately, it was costing them nine cents a ride. <laughs> and maybe that's the story of mass transit from to, to this day, right? <laughs> to this day. <clears throat> um, uh, it's interesting. They actually had to hook a, a, an extra mule up to get up Tang Street because of the hills there. Uh, that really kind of had a, a spotty history. It wasn't that well organized. Um, Madison needed something new and bigger. And so in uh, 1892, uh, they authorized uh, an electric streetcar. Appleton had done one, Milwaukee had done one, and it was the thing. Uh, it had the power to go up King Street. It actually had the power to go 30 miles an hour. Yeah, the first day it opened, or the, um, the first year it opened, there was this is a little bit sad. Um, there are many stray dogs. And um, they actually got, there was a lot of dogs that were killed because um, this was going so fast. Um, maybe I shouldn't have shared that. Uh, <laughs> college students, being college students, if you notice, the, the, the wheels are in the center of the trolley, right? And so you could go to one end and derail the trolleys. And college students did that. 
Um, this is uh, uh, some Redditor created this map, and it's a map of our streetcar system, and it really helped fuel the growth of the city. Uh, now, all of a sudden, you have modern transportation to get you to the city center. Right? Um, <clears throat> beyond the area that the streetcar served, there were suburbs, right? And the internal combustion engine allowed things like uh, these buses, right? And so uh, a lot of the suburbs, like Nakoma, Shorewood Hills, Maple Bluff, and Monona, um, the developers would put in service these buses, and they would charge 10 cents a ride. It allowed someone to live in Monona and work in, in the city. Uh, Madison's first car was 1901. However, the big change happened in 1908 when the Model T was introduced. Um, in just eight years, 1916, uh, autos outnumbered horses in the city of Madison. Eight years, okay. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Bob LaFollette's funeral in 1921, 13 years after the introduction of the Model T. Okay. This is a picture of State Street <coughs> in 1928, 20 years after the introduction of the Model T. And this uh, also affected uh, our streetcars, right? For 40 years, we had a, a streetcar system, but they switched to buses in 1934 and 35 because buses could go anywhere, right? Whereas a streetcar had to go in one place where the tracks were. And buses became part of our critical infrastructure. They've really served Madison for, for decades. Um, <clears throat> however, there were larger forces at play in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, this is a picture of Broadacre City from uh, Frank Lloyd Wright, um, which really is kind of a misnomer because it says Broadacre City, but it was really about suburbs, not cities, right? Uh, William Levitt and other thinkers thought, well, why do you have to live in the city if this automobile can take you to the city and you can live in the country? And that really influenced us for decades. Um, <coughs> things that helped that along included the National Housing Act of 1934, which helped provide uh, means for people to buy houses, build houses. The Federal H Aid Highway Act of 1956, which helped give us our freeway system. Um, <clears throat> and so our landform began to change. These are two aerial images of different neighborhoods in the city of Madison. The left is uh, quite dense. It's, it's near downtown. It's a grid system. Uh, you can ride a, you know, drive a bus along that and pick up a lot of people. To the left is in the southwest portion of the city, and it's more suburban. There's disconnected uh, streets. Um, the density is quite a bit lower. <clears throat> so if we l think about you know, Dane County's population growth. Um, this is a graph that's, to me, it's interesting, interesting maybe for you. Um, the blue represents the population of the city of Madison, and then the orange represents the population of everything but Madison, all the cities and villages but Madison. So you can see from 1900 to about 1970, there was really a migration to the city, right? The city was where everything was happening. You didn't want to be in, in some town on the outskirts of Dane County. But with the, the growing suburbanization, um, <clears throat> the, the outlying communities started to pick up population, and no one, right, no, the growth of the city kind of uh, stagnated, right, because people wanted to live in the suburbs. Um, it's been interesting, though, since 2010. You can see they're kind of growing at the same trajectory, right? Everywhere you look in Madison, we're getting more dense. And actually, you go to Sun Prairie or Fitchburg, and they're getting more dense, too. We're growing all over. Um, this is a, a graphic that shows the city of Madison's annexation by decade. But you can see at the farther out you get from the, the core of the employment, um, you need a way to get to the employment, right? So the dispersed development often requires more reliance on auto transportation. Um, <clears throat> so if we go back to this picture, you know, the, the picture on the left, the traditional development, that's transit friendly. We can drive a bus through there and pick up 60 passengers an hour. On the, on the right, that's transit challenging. First, we have to zigzag around, and if we, we go there for an hour, we pick up five passengers an hour. You see what I'm saying? And many people that live in places like the right say, well, I would take transit if it was um, easier, you know, or if it's more free, but it's so hard to serve that, you know, cost effectively. Um, 
other ways that the city of Madison leaned into auto transportation, the, <clears throat> the building of the John Nolan Causeway in the 1960s. You know, that's, you think about that, that's amazing. We just basically built a road in the middle of a lake. You know what I mean? Whether it's good or bad, it's just pretty amazing. Um, these are uh, the engineers from Strand Associates, actually, um, and the city engineer on an abutment for the bridges of John Nolan Drive. <clears throat> Madison Beltline was approved by the State Highway Commission in 1948 and it started construction in uh, 1949. The interstate system, here's a, the I-90-1218 interchanges completed in 1962. Uh, Manchester Department Store Parking, this is called pigeonhole parking. Everyone's in, you know, everyone's living in the outskirts. They need an automobile, and if you want to shop, you have to put your car someplace, right? So parking became a huge focus. This is law parking lot in 1958. Best way to use lakefront property, right? <laughs> <coughs> this is a Doty ramp in 1958, constructed. This was uh, just one of four um, ramps that were constructed downtown. You know, we had uh, Government North, Wilson Street, Overture, the county one. Um, it was all needed, demanded for. We needed that parking, right? This is a postcard that uh, was in my files when I started my work. I, I think it's from the 1970s, but they say it's easy to shop in Madison. Here are your guide to over 10,000 parking spaces in Madison. So this is a State Street congestion in 1969. Right, see, see that right there? That's a cyclist, and and he's breaking the law because bicycling along the square or in State Street was outlawed in 1965 by the city council. Hard to believe, right? <coughs> um, because of the growth of the automobile, uh, we lost our passenger rail service. In fact, our last train to Chicago uh, went July 21st, 1961. Um, buses had problems too. Uh, in 1968, due to, the, to a strike and declining revenue, voters approved the purchase of the Madison Co Bus Company by the city. Okay, the bus the bus company they couldn't make it anymore, and yet it provided a vital service, and so the city had to step to the plate. So if we kind of do a, a summary overview, you could say you know from the 1860s to the 1935s, we were really focused on transit, kind of compact development, living together, and uh, from 1935 on, we really leaned into the automobile, and uh, that influenced our growth patterns and the way we do things. And right now, we have a little purple dot, which means that we have an opportunity to decide how we continue. Um, there were outcomes from these decisions, and I don't they were probably unintended consequences because, you know, Frank Lloyd Wright thought this was the best thing in the world, but he couldn't see 100 years down what are some of those outcomes. Uh, let's just look at cost. Um, I'm letting you look at our books right now. Uh, <clears throat> we are proposing to uh, reconstruct the Lake Street ramp over on, on campus. It's going to cost us $120,000 per stall. $120,000 per stall. So the debt service on that, a 30-year, 3.5%, if you can get 30-year, 3.5%, I don't know, right? Bankers here. Um, that's about <clears throat> $530 a month, right? Costs us $190 a month to, to man the parking, to do repairs and the like. So overall, that stall costs us about $720 a month. Uh, our average revenue per stall in 2018 was $212 a stall. Okay. So we actually are providing a $500 subsidy every month for people to use their autos. So, so you, what? Per space. Yeah. So sometimes we, you know, we think, oh, we're, I don't want to subsidize busing, but we're subsidi we subsidize auto use, right? Now, this is an extreme example because these stalls are really expensive, don't you think? We should tell the contractor they should build them for less. Um, <coughs> but, um, you know, we still do this as a city because it still provides value in supporting our businesses, right? You know, we, we want um, State Street to, th to thrive. We want to be able to go to UW events. But um, most people, when they pay for their parking, they complain about it. 
and they don't realize that they're really you're only paying for maybe 30 or 50 percent of the cost of that parking lot. Um, how am I doing on time? Uh, street costs. Our streets are 50 percent bigger to accommodate course car storage. Uh, on the left is a picture of Rutledge Street. I think it's built in the 10s or the 20s. Okay, 28 feet wide. On the right <coughs> is our current subdivisions ordinances, 48 feet wide, room for for cars. Right. For 60 years, our subdivision ordinances have really mandated that our streets be wide, right? And so but think about the cost of those streets, right? And then we have to, every 40 years, we have to reconstruct that street, right? And so we endure that cost, you know, for, for decades into the future. And people don't think, oh, and this is all paid with property taxes. This is not your gas tax. Your, your gas tax helps freeways, right? Your gas tax doesn't help these, these roads. Um, this has an effect on our vehicle miles traveled, okay? In the United States, we've seen a 60% population increase since 1970, but our vehicle miles traveled has had a 190% increase. Um, so people are driving almost double what they did in the 1970s. So I got my license in the 70s. I won't ask for a show of hands. <laughs> but, um, so, you know, that's interesting, you know, interesting. Um, the cost, that, that in turn has a cost of the climate. This is a graph that shows our carbon concentrations and then our carbon emissions, right, uh, from the 1750 to today. And then I've superimposed our global average temperature, okay. So maybe it's just a correlation. Maybe they're not related, but it, you know, it, it just looks like that graph is pretty similar. Um, I grew up in California. Um, and when I grew up, there were just never fires there. You know, I don't remember fires. And now my brothers still live there. There's fires all the time in California, all the time. They can't, in fact, they're losing insurance because they, they can't insure their places. Um, let's look at cost in life. Uh, this is our motor vehicle deaths and rates in the United States from 1913 to 2021. Recently, it was 47,000 deaths per year. 47,000 deaths. This is our uh, deaths compared to other peer countries. Okay, this is road accidents deaths per one million inhabitants from '94 to 2021. And so you can see we have Australia there, Belgium, Germany, France, Japan, United Kingdom. Our death rate is three or four times higher than the death rate of our peers. In fact, from 19, 2010, our pedestrian deaths are up 72%, our bicycle deaths are up 55%, our motorcycle deaths are up 31%, all fatalities are up 30%. So it kind of begs the question, if our transportation choices were a pill, would the FDA approve it? Yeah. You can have this pill, and it, it makes things more convenient for you, but it's only going to kill 47,000 people a year, you know? And it's, it's not like other countries have a third of the deaths per population that we do, a third. So why can't we do that? Um, so what are we doing about it? We're focusing on safety instead of speed, and we're making other modes more viable. I'm at 21 minutes. I'm doing good. Um, <clears throat> Vision Zero is a big initiative. We launched it about three years ago. Um, the focus is it's a strategy to eliminate all traffic fatalities, severe injuries, while increasing safe, healthy, and equitable mobility for all. Uh, we use this graphic um, on the right frequently. If you look at the 40 mile an hour on the right side, if a, four, a vehicle traveling 40 miles an hour hits a pedestrian, there's a 7 in 10 chance that that pedestrian is going to die. Now, if you go to the left, if a vehicle traveling 20 miles an hour hits a pedestrian, there's only a 1 in 10 chance that pedestrian is going to die. That means 9 in 10 chance they'll live. So we are making a big focus on reducing speed. So when it takes you an extra 30 seconds to get downtown, that's, that's the reason why we think that the life's more important than the time. Um, 
and we have a vision zero action plan, safe streets for all, safe streets to Madison, where we're trying to, to push this forward. Complete green streets. Um, this was just enacted, I think, adopted in January of this year. Um, it used to be when you would do a street, you'd make room for the autos, and then if you had any leftover space, you'd put in sidewalks to maybe have a bike lane, right? Well, we're changing that. We're saying, no, everyone walks, right? Everyone walks. And so pedestrians are at the top of our priority list, followed by transit and cyclists. And then car storage, car storage is at the bottom. We will make a sacrifice at the bottom, parking, so that people can walk and have sidewalks. Place, safe places. Um, now let's talk about bus rapid transit. And it's kind of interesting. Um, I was here four years ago and I gave a talk on bus rapid transit and it was just a dream then. And it's happening. It's kind of neat. Um, this is a rendering of a bus rapid transit station by uh, Forest Street. It'll bring Madison to the next level in public transportation. Um, the <coughs> the east-west line is what's shown in red. The north-south line is what's shown in green. We hope to start it in uh, 2024. And I think it would be kind of cool if we could start it November 16th. That would be 150 years to the day when uh, mass transit started it in Madison. Now, I don't know if our contractor will agree with that or not. Um, <coughs> there we go. Um, East-West BRT, uh, it will connect all, you know, 95,000 people will be within a half mile of it. Um, almost 100,000 jobs will be in a half mile of bus rapid transit. 27,000 um, communities, people of color. Uh, here you can see some of the stations uh, that are being constructed. These are on the west side. Have any of you seen some of the stations? Yeah, that's good. They haven't made it to the east side yet, and that's where I live. So. Uh, this is what a uh, rendering of what the, the station on the square will look like. We are just starting north-south bus rapid transit. We submitted our application in August to the FTA, and we'll hear our, about our rating in March. Uh, we have public meetings coming up. Um, November 1st at the Urban League, 2nd at Warner Park. Uh, November 8th will be virtual. November 9th will be in Fitchburg. Um, the north-south BRT, will provide access to 97,000 people, 78,000 jobs, um, 33,000 people of color. It really uh, helps provide a high level of service to our north and south sides, which is really important. Um, we are hoping to um, um, use these federal monies to, to reimagine what Park Street could look like. We would like to reconstruct a Park Street so that we have our bus lanes right, but have ever you, any of you ever tried to ride a bike on Park Street? Yeah. All right. We would like to have a shared use path. Have any of you seen all the great shade trees on Park Street? No. Yes. We would like to have shade trees on Park Street. So this is contingent on us uh, qualifying for the grant, but it's in our project uh, planning that we will reconstruct Park Street and make it a nicer street. Uh, these are some of the uh, preliminary dimensions that we're working through. Transit network redesign. That launched in June. Um, why did we even do this? You know, And part of it was is that we had a 25-year-old system that served different people differently. Right? Um, people of color had a, a transfer rate that was three times greater than um, people like me, white, white people. Right? Uh, low income <clears throat> had a transfer rate that's double. So um, sure, it was great for me where I live, but if, if you lived in some of these other areas of the city, and then weekend service was terrible, like you, or non-existent. In fact, this is what it look, looked like, uh, how many buses we had on the road in our previous system. If you had a job from 8 to 5, it was great. You had lots of buses. But if you had a job working a quick trip from 12 to 8, there are hardly any buses. You know, that's not really fair, right? So. So we launched the redesign, and there's been a lot of discussion about it. <laughs> um, um, the idea is, is that uh, we, want, we want to even it out. We want to even it out. 
um, some of the benefits, the routes are more frequent. In fact, if you're on the red or some of the dark blue lines, it's, it's every 15 minutes. You, know, you don't even have to check a schedule. Right? The ridership is increasing. Our weekend and evening service is considerably better. Okay? Um, we still are working through some challenges. Uh, I'm on time performance. Our buses are late. I guess there's a lot of construction in the city. Um, <coughs> our buses downtown are, are, are overcrowded, right? And some riders have to walk further. And you know, for me, if I have to walk an extra 500 feet, it's not that much harder. But some of our people that have mobility issues, uh, they're finding that it's harder. Uh, passenger rail. Uh, bipartisan infrastructure law provides $102 billion for passenger and freight rail, a 561 increase. We're trying to capture it. Um, um, we're applying for the federal corridor ID program. The announcements will, will be out in November. So there probably will be a newspaper article, I suspect, in the, next, in the coming weeks on whether or not we qualify. Um, we have a draft report being prepared. Public meetings will probably occur in January. We'd like to bring back what we lost in 1961. Um, and so that's that, and I did it in 28 minutes. My name is Susan Schmitz. Yeah. Hi, Tom. Um, I think you know what I might be asking about, but um, but could you talk a little bit about um, the effort that Madison had or actually Dane County had with uh, enabling legislation for RTAs years ago, and what happened with that? Just briefly, you can explain that, and then are, is the is Dane County or the greater Madison area still looking to create that enabling legislation? Because you talked about yeah. um, financing all of this and yeah. how much it really costs. Yeah. So, um, uh, and thank you for all right. Thank you. Uh, many uh, states, red and blue, allow regional transit authorities uh, to exist to do cross boundaries because you know you think about it, transportation covers many things. Uh, our state legislature does not allow us to do that. It not, does not allow a taxing authority. Um, we are actively working with partnerships. We have contracts with all of our partners. We, I think we have 13 partners. And we're trying to set up a group that would function kind of as an RTA board if we were ever allowed to have an RTA. So, um, but you know, that legislation will have to change for that to occur. I'm very happy to hear about your sensitivity to Park Street and the need for trees. Yeah. And um, there's been a lot of information in the newspaper about Lake Mendota Drive and also um, Mineral Point Road about taking trees down to accommodate sidewalks. Do you intend to be replanting trees in those areas? Yeah, actually, uh, I think it's time for me to leave. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so actually, uh, I think I just was at a public meeting um, last night for Mineral Point Road. I'll, it's important for us, uh, and that particular one, um, a cyclist died last year, right in on Mineral Point Road. Uh, we are putting in a, a uh, widened sidewalk, shared use path on it. Uh, we are able to save 85% uh, of the trees. So 85% of the trees are going to be there. 15% uh, we do at intersections, at culverts, uh, we do need to remove. We're going to be replanting those. Uh, so a lot of the information um, that was in the media was not correct. We're taking, or we need to remove about half of what was reported. So, um, and we do value trees. We also value lives. And so we, we, that cyclist shouldn't have died. We want to provide a safe place for people to be. So. To, uh, to make the RT work, it's going to have to, I think, be really done slick and well. What are some of the things you're doing, like, for example, uh, advanced ticketing or other changes to, re to really make BRT appealing to people? Yeah, so our stations will, we hope to have a, a, a fare system where you just tap, tap a, a pad when you go on. They'll have ticketing at the station. It'll be level boarding. I don't know if any of you have been on a bus where it's had to pick up a, let's say, a wheelchair or the like. Well, wheelchairs will be able to roll right into it. Uh, we have left side boarding. 
So it should be quite a bit quicker. And we'll have dedicated lanes, which means that a lot of the traffic congestion that slows buses down now, we won't have that. Thank you for telling the story about the cost of the automobile. Um, I live next to the hairball intersection. Yeah. We struggled through two years of construction, hoping it would get better. I never crossed there without someone beside me agreeing with me that it is worse, it feels less safe, even though much more real estate has been deployed in creating it. How are you going to go back and fix it? Yeah, actually, um, uh, it's, um, it's actually uh, has less pavement than the previous version. So if you were, it has um, <clears throat> a little bit less. Um, it's, a, it's a challenging intersection. Um, it is a little bit better for cyclists. We have a cycle path that goes through it. Yeah, well, and, uh, and then we also have left turn lanes that weren't there before. It's, it's a challenging one, you know. Um, you know, the way to solve it would be to cut off a leg, right? To say one leg can't enter that. So which leg would you choose? You know, it's, it's uh, we looked, you can't go underground. You know, it's uh, probably if we were to do it today, we might maybe reduce a lane. Um, it is on a state highway, so we can't necessarily do anything we want because uh, the city of Madison is willing to live with more congestion than the state of Wisconsin is. Actually, thank you for giving me this opportunity. Thank you, Tom. We're, uh, we're having an on-time arrival, so I hope your bus is on time. Uh, thank you all for joining us. I hope you will come back next week. And um, our speakers will be Anne and Josh Thundercloud, who will provide us with an introduction to Native American powwows. So it will be very, very interesting. Um, so before we uh, depart, um, let's please stand and uh, we'll recite the rotary four-way test together of the things we think, say, and do. Is it the true? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build goodwill and better friendships? Will it be beneficial to all concerned? Have a great week, everyone. We are adjourned.